there, my name is Jaden George and I am going to be doing a book review on the book that I chose called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. It's a weird name I know but that's why I was attracted to it and I promise you will like it. So I would like to start out by telling you my objective for this presentation. I would like people to understand at the end of this that there are many different situations or disorders but they all have one commonality. and. This book is extremely formatted, so I want to wait until the end to tell you what the commonality is. Before I tell you about that, I want to go over somewhat of the overview. So, this book is a series of short stories or anecdotes that are written by different doctors who are conducting experiments with different patients with many different disorders. So, this book is not just singled in on one type of disorder is actually many and to be specific there are 24 chapters those 24 chapters are split up into four different categories which i will get to in a minute but the main author who is oliver Sacks, he compiled all of these and conducted many of them himself so he's a very popular writer and maybe some of you will know his name so some of these um bizarre stories they're not the typical types of things that you read in class so there are bizarre stories that involve cerebral palsy, phenomenal mathematical abilities, a young autistic man who possesses an incredible talent in drawing, people that don't think that their own body is controlled by themselves, patients with syphilis, and patients who have seizures, and so many more. So these are just a few of the examples. Not all of them I gave a medical name to, but just that gives you an idea of some of these. So, um... So the four categories that they're all split into, there's six disorders under every category. These categories are losses, such as like how we talk about in class, hearing loss or um, memory loss, the type of things that happen in the brain where there's a loss um, prevalent. Then the next, the next part is called excesses, which is added things. So this is things like ticks or Tourette's. So that's typically what we see the most in that category. The next is transports, which is how we experience memory and how we reminisce. So how we look back on things during our lives that we look back on and just how our memory is used. <laughs> and then the life of the simple, that's the last category. And that includes a lot with autism, which is something that we talk about in this class. So that's a relevance to our class as well. And so the major themes in this book are equalization and ad adaptation. Um, this is very prevalent. So I actually made note of all of the chapters that include this and how prevalent it is. There are 22 chapters that include this adaptation and equivalence. The other two out of the 24 do not. So that just tells you a little bit about that. Illness being a gift, that's the second theme. And that's only found in 17. So in a lot of these, they don't see that theme a lot. So a lot of them, they don't feel like their illness is a gift. It's more of on the, the other end. It's not as helpful. And then the last one is conceptions of mental illness. So this is a big one, especially for our class, like our objective in the beginning that I was very drawn to, which was how it's portrayed in the media. So conceptions of their mental illness. And this is very prevalent, which is 20 chapters out of the 24. So a lot of them feel this way about their illness. So some aspects of each story, which is in every single case study or chapter, they have the same format, which Sachs puts them into. So he describes what they saw when they first came up to him, what he analyzed or interpreted of what they saw when they met him. So what he noticed in the beginning and how he kind of took that into consideration. And then the next was the storyline of the interaction. So basically just how they interacted with each other. For example, so the man who mistook his wife for hat, that is Dr. P. So I'm going to refer to him as Dr. P and I'm going to refer to his case a lot because there's just too many to go over. But um, Saxon and Dr. P engage in a casual conversation at first, when they first meet each other. And it's not immediately to figure out what's wrong with him. Sax is only trying to get a sense of his personality and actually get some personality behind what he's analyzing. So he's not immediately going in with the mind to diagnose him right away, which is typical for neurologists. So this is different. Then they go into the testing, which is these crazy experiments because something you'll notice in this field of neurology or of conducting experiments is that they have to be very um, creative. They have to they have to come up with these experiments themselves to get a sense of 
what the behavioral response of the patient is because you can't just go into someone's brain because you know it's so unpredictable that you don't know where it is in the brain until you have hit something that is behaviorally noticed that can be taken as a sign of where that um, disorder lies in their brain so you need to get creative with your behavioral responses and your testing yes and then now I'm gonna play a quick video for you because I want you to see what Dr. P has. It's called Visual Agnosia, and yeah, so just watch that really quick, and I'll be right back. We asked Kevin what he sees when he looks at things. I see uh, colors, shapes, um, punctuated by faces, the faces of people which I really recognize, and they stand out much more than anything else. That's why I can't read words or read music anymore. So um, I still can imagine what that looks like in my mind's eye, but I can't imagine what it looks like, or I can't see what it looks like when I look at it. So essentially, I find things through color. In fact, the brain needs both the structural and semantic processing to be able to interpret information transmitted through vision. I can sometimes pick out small components of an object and by using memory as a reference, infer what it might be. Like if something's long and silver, it could be a spoon or a fork or a knife. And usually I'll use my hands to touch the end of it. So I know, oh, it's a fork or it's a, it's a knife or it's a spoon. So um, memory does play an important role in that and in everything I look. I mean, I come to this, this chair. I know, it's, I know it's a chair. I don't know what type of chair it is. I know it's pink, but I was able to sit down in it. But this is my house, so I know where everything is. I'm back. So I hope that that was helpful for you guys. I just know how full Carrie's videos for me are in class, so I just wanted to add one in so you guys could see what visual agnosia looks like. So hopefully you learned a little something from that. Um, but this relates to Dr. P because he mistook his wife for a hat. So without that holistic sense of her as a person, he confuses his sensory data easily. So he will associate things to her that are not, that are inanimate, inanimate objects. So her dark hair, he might associate with a hat. Um, that's what Dr. Sachs mentioned also. So just things about her that he could somehow distinguish together. Um, so the diagnosis of this began when Dr. Sachs noticed that Dr. P was having trouble with the concept of his left. So as we learned in class, this means that the right hemisphere of your brain is usually affected. So well, is always affected. <laughs> and so that's what he discovered, that there was a problem with the right hemisphere. So he began to ask questions after the diagnosis, after the experiment, sorry, such as how are they seeing what's in front of them? How are they interpreting it? How are they handling it? Um, and then diagnosing without even being able to touch the brain, because we know that we can't go into the brain and find what's wrong. You have to figure it out from a physical distance. Um, you have to notice from the outside. So an example of this, also using Dr. P as an example, um, he, uh, Dr. Sachs con conducted an experiment where he handed Dr. P a glove and said, what is this object? So Dr. P analyzed the object, he held it, he felt it, he said it's a continuous surface with five pouches. Um, he then said, maybe it's for coins he said maybe it's a coin organizer just you know just not saying a glove so dr Sachs saw that and that's what he used for his treatment so for treatment he asked questions like in all of the all of these um chapters they're all the same process so the the questions the experiments the treatment it's all in the same order for each one Everyone's just different um, depending on their disorder. So, and then comes the treatment after the experiment. And he asks, how did the patient react to what was going on? How did they react to the changes depending on the experiment? Were they able to identify the change that was happening in front of them or if something was wrong? Which in this case, Dr. P did not. He could not tell that there was anything wrong and he thought that everything was fine until someone had to tell him that it was an incorrect answer. And then the next question is very important. How will they be able to cope or go on with this disorder? In this case, Sachs suggests that Dr. P immerses himself in more music. 
there's only certain things that we can do to help the situation as we know that these disorders are often not reversible and there are no cures for them we have to figure out ways to cope and move on with it and move forward with your life that's a big concept too i think for sax so for dr p scientifically a large portion of the cerebral cortex is dedicated to the coding of object information so the part of his brain that can code information and can tell what something is we can name an object we can name tons and tons of objects so that's thanks to that part in our brain so since his part of the brain um located in the lateral occipital cortex and ventral temporal cortex that's where his issue lied so what would happen if there was a lesion in this area or this part of the visual system well what he has is your answer it's visual agnosia so that's what he suffers from so as we know from this class that we're taking whichever part of the brain is affected has an effect on that part of the body physically so Phineas Cage this is an example from the book um, this was one of the studies that was conducted he got into a really bad work accident which resulted in a large iron rod driven through his head completely destroying a lot of his brains left frontal lobe but instead of any memory loss or physical paralysis nothing was affected besides his personality so his personality was affected very negatively he became very violent very unpleasant very angry he actually was not able to hold a job because no one wanted him to work for them when he had that type of um, personality so his frontal lobe was damaged which manifests through the personality which explains his scenario so I'm now going to go into the author's purpose. So why Sachs wrote this, I believe it was because he wanted to create a source that was interesting yet educational for people who weren't wanting a PhD in neuroscience, who weren't expecting to go into this field. He wanted to make it entertaining for everyone to read, which I think he did a great job in, but I'll get into that in a little while. So his point of view, from his standpoint, he was a professional medical neurologist. That's what Dr. Sachs was, and that's where he was writing from. I believe that there are many purposes for Sachs writing this book, but based on some follow-up research I did, he's very shy, and he's, very, he's a very kind person. So he loved to get to know the people's personality that he was um, observing, and it wasn't just about other scientists, like I mentioned, where... They just wanted to diagnose and then get out. It was more of a personality type thing. He wanted to create something that people could possibly look back on someday. So today, this day and age, it's an old book, but um, people could look back and see how, what he did and what advice he would give them to um, cope with it. He wants us to know what these people experience and to put ourselves in their shoes and look at their perspective. He also wants us to learn how these diagnoses take place and the process by which they do. All this scientific research he's doing, the process, how you can tell that that's going on, and yes, that type of thing. Also, this is very important, he wants to highlight the conceptions of mental illness, especially nowadays in the media. This was a really big thing for me going into this class when I saw the objective about communication disorders in the media and how we cannot, can, we can assume things. We have to do our own research which nowadays does not happen very often. So that's a big thing for me, but um, I'll get into that in a little while too. He understands that these illnesses are typically determined by prejudice, by what's most convenient, and by tradition rather than science. So those three concepts, prejudice, convenience, and tradition, they play a big role nowadays in what people think about these kinds of disorders and that needs to not happen when there's scientific research that he's done right in front of you that you can go look at and that's what he's trying to say he wants us to feel sympathy for those who are going through these disorders and create a sense of understanding to where we are growing our knowledge on their perspectives as well he wants us to know what these people experience and put ourselves in that perspective as i said before he created it this way because he wanted it to be entertaining yet educational at the same time while we're on our toes waiting for the next story but also don't want the last story to end. So 
he makes these stories so engaging that you don't want to leave that story you want to continue reading it but you're excited for the next story as soon as it as soon as it arrives so he's making a source that is entertaining for in order for people to read about the science as well as the entertainment because he knows that people are drawn to entertainment so he's trying to intertwine science into that which is an amazing way of doing that i think that it was so good so he's absolutely successful i wanted the stories to be longer but then my excitement for the next story formed as i was entering the next one so the results of this i think it was absolutely a very successful book it got me to think about the lifestyles of each disorder i learned so much about how each of these individuals adapted to their certain situation and it made me think about how I'd adapt if I was in that situation as well. This book has changed my values a lot in terms of what could have been. How I would feel if I was in their situation. I know I would want people to listen to me. I know that I would want people to make me feel heard. And make me feel not alone. Because I know that's a big thing for me is not, not being alone in situations. That scares me really bad. So I would want people to take my advice and learn from me as I'm going through something that's not typical. I also now understand that my normal is not the same as someone else's normal because normal is a very subjective term. Not everyone's normal is going to be the same as ours. That tells you that based on society's norms, normal is just not the same for everyone. So that's something to keep in mind and I learned that a lot from this book. I will absolutely think of all these disorders in different ways and remember what these people have to go through. The greatest strength of this book, I believe, is that it keeps you engaged, it keeps you reading, it keeps you, it keeps you wanting more information, and even after you're done reading it, you will look up the disorders. I kept going and continued my research. The weakness is the length. It is pretty short. If you want a deeper personality type of view, um, this, is not, this is not the type of book for that. This is more just using people as examples rather than going into depth about their lives, which is not typical for books. Because I know I have always been interested in books that go deeper into the person's lifestyle. So, on to recommendation. Um, having all of this information intertwined in his stories, which had a lot of exposition, a lot of emotion, and information that was very reliable. Because that's very important, is reliable information. Which makes you feel for the patient and the physician and the medical staff that's involved as well. Because this was happening right in front of them. I can't imagine what that would have been like for them too, along with the patient. So, yes, and this causes you to catch on to the information and subconsciously learn without having to sit through it and thinking that you're being forced to retain something that you don't want to. You are genuinely interested and it's for people that are not just, like I said, going into a PhD for neuroscience. Anyone can read this and anyone can gather their information because of the way that Sachs wrote it. So yes, and then these are something that I want people to remember when walking away from this book is these are char these are not characters. These are real people who went who are going through real experiences and a lot of them are probably still alive today. We need to put ourselves in their shoes and not think that our normal is another person's normal. So my objective recap commonality <laughs> is that they're all people who deserve to be heard. They are all people who deserve to have their stories heard. They all deserve to live how they want and not be fitted into society's normal because we all know that that's, it's, it's not the same. We should learn from these people. We should be taking their experiences and taking them to heart and not just expecting what society expects and knowing that everyone's normal is the same because it's not like that at all. So I hope that you found this helpful and I hope that you enjoyed it and learned something and that you can take something away from this because I know I definitely did. So thank you so much for listening this long and it was long, but um, yes, I hope you guys all have a great day and yeah, thank you so much. Bye.